Welcome to episode 67 of the Talking Ferris podcast. Ben Fadden here with a special guest, Jim Russell of Extra 1360. Does the wrap-up show, which is a, a great you know post-game show reaction uh, with uh, John Schaefer, who we've had on the podcast. Jim, thanks so much for talk, for taking the time to talk. Yeah, man, appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we got a whole lot to talk about. Uh, it's been a good, it was, it's been uh, a hectic week. It, it was a quiet week which I didn't really understand at first. Um, I, I guess that's the first question. What were you surprised that it took this long for Jace Tingler to uh, be relieved of his duties? At first I was surprised, but then knowing the relationship that him and AJ have, you knew this was a hard decision for Preller to make. Right. Um, I did think with how disappointing the season was and how this season ended, they needed to be like upfront right away. They needed somebody to talk. I thought no later than Tuesday. Um, didn't happen. You know, they fired him on, on Wednesday. Um, that was actually the cutoff date. If they did not fire Jace Tingler on Wednesday, they would have to wait until the end of the world series to do anything. So we should all know, known that and that something was going to happen Wednesday. But yeah, I'm, I'm a little surprised that they didn't come out right away and talk um, just because of how disappointing the season was. Like these mm-hmm. fans are upset and rightfully so. And, you know, they need they need to hear from the people that are in charge. Um, mm-hmm. It happened Wednesday. So better late than never, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Um, man, so. Peter Seidler also, okay, so this was weird. You know, Peller had the press conference uh, kind of not answering a lot of the questions, just kind of just talking, you know, his usual minute replies, and he didn't really say anything. He says a lot without saying anything. And then Seidler comes, talks to the media, and this was interesting. I wrote a piece on GasLampBall.com about it today, and I did not like the messaging that he had. You know, he was talking about Preller. You know, he was asked, is Preller, you know, safe? Is he, even if, you know, they don't make the playoffs next year? And he's saying, yeah, he was, he's safe. He has 100% confidence in him uh, in terms of hiring a manager and constructing a team. And I have more confidence in him constructing a team than the manager because he's, I think he's done a pretty good job, you know, pa- putting the team in a position, you know, paper on paper wise to win. But I guess my question is, what do you, What's your reaction when you hear Peter Seidler just continue to have this attachment to AJ? You know, is it the extension or what? Uh, My first reaction is disappointment because it kind of feels like, what are you seeing that we aren't? Mm -hmm. You know, this is seven years now and you are three managers in and you are now 30 coaches that you have fired as Dennis Lynn reported that it's by far the most turnover in baseball Mm -hmm. seven year window. Like, what are you seeing that we aren't? Because you can't point to the record. You can't point to playoff runs. You can't point to stability. Like the only thing you can really point to is, yeah, they have Fernando Tatis Jr. And Manny Machado. That's great. But you have nothing to show for it. They're, they're becoming the angels. Angels have Mm -hmm. Shohei and Mike Trout. That's great. But that's not translating to wins. And for me, like, I care more, and this might sound crazy, I care more about wins and losses than I do mm-hmm. about jersey sales. Mm-hmm. And do I, I, then I do about swag chains that are being sold. Like, if this team was a bunch of nobodies and they won 95 games, I would be through the roof, and I'm sure every fan would love the it. The Rays are playing right now, yeah. Yeah, the Rays are playing right now. I couldn't name you a single Rays player on that team. Swear yeah, to God, I, I can't mean, name I can anybody. Name like five, but yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, and and they're doing great. Like, I don't understand where Peter is getting this trust from. Now, granted, he can't come out in the media and just openly bash AJ Preller while yeah. they go and that while they have to make another managerial hire. Like, it would look so bad on the organization if Sider came out and was just like, you know what. I don't really have faith in AJ actually. Um, he's not doing a good job. And this is his last hire as manager. If he doesn't get it right, then he's fired. That would be that would be, that would be a horrible look for the right, organization. But what I was like, what I was asking is don't say that he'd be safe if they don't make the playoffs next year. Say 
at least say something like, uh, you know, we're, we're expecting to be in the playoffs next year. We're expecting to build a great team uh, again. But to just say, no, like to say that, no, he's safe if even if they don't make the playoffs next year. Injuries happen. I get that. But what when was this window? What This window is shrinking now mm-hmm. with the Darvish and the Snell and the Musgroves, at least on their current contracts. And obviously Machado in his prime, that window is shrinking. And so as the years go on, it's going to get more and more frustrating for Padres fans to just hear the owner saying, hey, no, he's not going to, he's, his job's not in jeopardy. At least just, I, I just want at least some accountability for this next season uh, because it seems like it's the opposite, the messaging wise between Seidler and Ron Fowler, you know, Ron saying heads will roll, you know, when he was the, you know, big voice of the team and Seidler's not really saying that. No, he's not. Um And it's frustrating. Like I get the frustration. I'm frustrated. You're frustrated. Everyone's frustrated because they're seeing the product on the field and it's not translating. Like the words that are being said don't match what the fans are watching. And that's the most frustrating part is you're seeing a team not even win 80 games again, yet you have 100% trust in a guy that has never proven that he can build a contending ball club. Like, yes, the team made the playoffs in a, in a 60 game season. I understand that. But if you want to really go and dissect that 60 game year, look what happened at the end of the 60 game season. You lost Clevenger and you lost Lamette. If that was 162 games, who would have said that that season wouldn't be exactly like this season? Like who, who knows? And so, you know, this year, yes, the first 60 games was great, but it tailed off uh, for the last two and a half, three months of the season. It, it is frustrating. I don't think that it would be right if Peter came out and said heads need to be rolled if they don't make the postseason. Um, but I would hope that behind closed doors, if him and AJ talked, and I'm sure they have, one-on-one, I would hope that the message from Peter to AJ was, look, I'm going to back you here. It's, it's a, it would be a bad look if I didn't. I'm going to give you 100% backing to the media. But I'm going to tell you, if you do not get this right, And if this team does not lock it up as far as the leaks go, as far as the players saying they don't want to be here, as far as the athletic reporting that you have a toxic work environment, you're a micromanager, you fire guys without really giving them a heads up and you just fire them as they're going to do their jobs. Like that cannot happen. And if you do not fix this in the next year, then we're done. But I'm going to back you just because I know it'd be a bad look. But for me and you, this is it. Now, I don't know if Peter would say that because he's like the nicest guy on the planet. Mm. Um, but I would hope that the owner of my favorite team, if I was a fan, like I would hope that they say that and that message is relayed to Preller because I don't know how much longer like people can, can deal with this because Tatis is great. Machado is great. Cronenworth is great. Musgrove is great. But you want to see wins and it's not happening right now. Yeah, and Manny wants to win too, just based on obviously the comments that he's making. And he's not going to. You got two more years until you have a decision if he's going to opt out or not. You have two more years. And Mm -hmm. then you you start being like, oh my God, is he going to really opt out here if we do not put a winner together? Like that's Mm -hmm. a big decision that's coming up here if they don't start winning. Yeah. Um, You mentioned, uh, you know, players, you know, just this this part kind of, pissed me off you know the trade deadline how players were so affected that Eric Hosmer was in trade talks I get it he's you know a great clubhouse leader or whatever they're saying and I get that that provide that that you know there's a meaning to that and that really helps guys like Tatis and the younger guys coming up but Manny's a leader too there's other guys that can take on that role shoot Fernando's gonna have to do that now um what did you make of it seemed like the team like just not being able to function just because Hosmer was in trade talks? Yeah, that's um that's disappointing. And this has happened two times now with mm-hmm. a majority of the same leaders in that clubhouse. It's like fool me once, shame on shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, like that type of thing where 
Hosmer, I, it's going to go down as the worst contract in franchise history. No question about it. Unless somehow he comes back next year and becomes an all-star, leads him to the playoffs and like becomes a postseason hero. Like there's nothing really that's going to change in my mind as far as how bad that contract looks. But going to back to your question about, you know, the players getting upset about Eric Hosmer. Well, you know what? Suck it up. It, this is not about you. This is about the team. And if Preller was going to try to get rid of Hosmer to make the team better, great. But if it didn't happen, then don't sulk about it. Like, go out there and rally and, you know, play for each other. And, and don't just hold a grudge for as long as this, it felt like this team did. And I, and I know that, you know, the whole Scherzer thing with, with Ken Rosenthal and that thing blew up. And, you know, I think that trade more than anything, more than the Hosmer thing affected this team, uh, mm-hmm. maybe a little bit more just because when they were report- even tweeted about it. Exactly. And you know, that everybody in that clubhouse was buzzing the second that report came out, like, Oh my God, we got Scherzer like, okay. And then you don't. And then, Oh, by the way, the same exact night you lose Chris Paddock and you lose Fernando Tatis jr. It was like a triple kick in the balls. And yeah, and you you didn't get any starting pitching, no Kenta Maeda, no Pineda, no Davies, nothing, nothing. And, and AJ Preller came out again and you know, the whole shifting blame thing that was said in the athletic article, if you go back and listen to what he said after the trade deadline, he said, point blank, if these players do not perform, we are not going to get where we need to get to. Yes, that's true. But also you have to read the room, AJ. You have to know that your pitching staff is barely surviving. You know that you don't have anybody in the farm system ready to go. Mackenzie Gore is so far off and he has fallen off a cliff. Ryan Weathers at the time was dealing with an injury and wasn't pitching. You Darvish had a back problem. Um, Blake Snell before he went on like a seven game stretch of pitching like Cy Young was not good. So Reese Kinnear is not going to save your season. Reese Kinnear, Jake Arrieta, Vince Velasquez, like those guys, those guys are not, you're right. They're not going to save your season. And yes, it's all, it's on the players. Absolutely. But AJ, you didn't give the guys any reinforcements. You just let them just go out there and let them die you know, with no help. And that's another thing I feel bad a little bit for Tingler is he was given this hand and Mm -hmm. yes, he didn't control that lock, that clubhouse. And yes, he made mistakes. And yes, he was um, not a great manager. Yes. The 16 inning game was horrific. His pitching decisions was bad, but who gave him the pieces to put out there? Who gave him this bullpen? Who gave him Reese Kinnear and Vince Velasquez and Jake Arrieta? That's AJ Preller. It all goes back to Preller. Everything you want to talk about this organization, from the player development, from the roster construction, from the coaches, from whatever you want to talk about with this organization, everything goes back to AJ Preller. And it's, um, yeah, that, that moment in the season, um, I said it should have its own 30 for 30 and Padres lore because I felt like the stuff that happened behind closed doors um, was, it was so interesting that I don't know if we'll ever know, but I tell you what, like, I, I really want to, I want to deep dive onto what was said in that clubhouse and the actual feelings from the players when that trade deadline happened and that week that with Hosmer so, and like, everything else. That feels such like a 20 year thing down the road where Manny and Hosmer definitely would be willing to just sit down and totally just air out everyone and everything that happened. Right. Uh, yeah. So talking about Hosmer, he has a 2.7 war in four seasons with the Padres. Uh, fans want him gone, obviously. Uh, but there has to be suitors, you know, on the other side for that to happen. And the contract's a barrier. Uh, maybe it's his personality to, you know, some effect is also a factor. Um, do you see, like, who do you even see? What suitors do you see even having interest in him? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know, but who cares about suitors? Like if this guy is really a cancer in your clubhouse and causing problems, just DFA him, just get rid of him. Like you're going to have to pay a boatload of his contract anyway to trade him to a team 
um, that, you know, the, the Royals or the Pirates or a team that is super low on payroll that might need somebody to fill up that payroll a little bit to get up, you know, with Major League Baseball's expectations as far as how much you can spend and how much they want teams to start spending. But either way, you're going to have to eat a boatload of his contract wherever he goes. You know, he has $60 million left on his deal. They tried to pay, reportedly, $40 million of the remaining, what, $65, $70 million this year that he, that he had. So, mm-hmm. I mean, if you're going to go that far to get rid of the guy, just why don't you just do the whole go all the way? Just go all the way, DFA him, get rid of him. If you can't find a suitor, and just get it over with. End this relationship. It's not working out. It's, I think it's ego. They, they, they don't, you know, DFAing him after signing him to what was the biggest contract in franchise history by a lot. Uh, I just don't see them doing that. I, well, I'm with Preller, you. Preller didn't have uh, any problem firing a guy that he stuck his neck out for this year and Jay Stingler. So yeah. what's, what's another mistake that AJ Preller can fess up to that he's made with this franchise? Like, see, but that's the thing. I, Preller obviously was the tingler thing, mm-hmm. but I think, I think Ron Fowler was big on bringing in hot. Oh yeah. So of course. I think he has to do it with ownership. That's the problem. Yeah, of course. And, yeah. and I remember covering that, that winter meetings, um, what was it? What was it? 2017 or 2018? I think it was yeah. 2018. Um, and you know, the Padres weren't really anything at that moment and they needed a big splash. And that was the guy, right? And you're right. Like, I think ownership had a lot to do with that. Um, but again, Preller had to sign off on it too. Like Preller had to make that happen. Yeah. Yes, the owners could push a guy to do something, but Preller, Preller was a, a big part of that as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So. How about Myers? Uh, do you think he'll be in a Padre uniform come next year? Um. With one year left on his deal, it might be the easiest now to trade him or get rid of him um, just because you don't have to eat as much money as you would have if you tried to trade him after the 2019 season. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't know if he's going to be on this roster, but I wouldn't be upset if he was. Like He's not, to me as big of a problem as Eric Hosmer is mm-hmm. will Myers still can give you a pop. Um, he can still hit 20 home runs. He's not a guy that I look at as like a problem in that clubhouse. Cause I feel like he's a totally chill, mellow guy and lay low. Like he doesn't want to be the leader. We know that he doesn't want to yeah. be outspoken and, uh, you know, doesn't want to be the guy that is viewed as the face of the franchise. Right. Um, so for me, I, I, I don't know if he's going to be on this roster next season, but I, I, I wouldn't like be upset if he was now, if they do want to have roster flexibility and you had to choose between getting, uh, sorry, it's my dog between getting, yeah, yeah. <laughs> between getting, you know, Eric Cosmer gone and, or Will Myers, it might be easier to get rid of Will Myers to get some roster flexibility just because he has only one year left uh, on his contract. So, right. Myers is one of those guys too, where it's like, I don't think the fan base, well, obviously the fan base doesn't <laughs> hate him. Like Cosmer, like no. he's, and he's one of those guys where it's like, okay, if the Potters are going to win, you want him on the team. He was here in 2016 and 2017 and 2018 when they were winning 70 games and had Eric Ibar as their shortstop. He, oh. he went, he, you know, he, he, he was through that. He went through that with all of us. So it's like, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, yeah, you want him here. Um, so, but yeah, I agree with you this year. I think this off season is the best chance uh, to trade him. Uh, with that said, how different do you see the lineup looking next year? You know, obviously first base you you think would be different. Hopefully maybe right field Tommy Pham may or may not come back on a one-year deal. Uh, I mean, Nola didn't look great this year, but you don't really have any option when you gave up that much for him. You got to kind of stick with that. So just what do you think about the lineup next year? Honestly, I don't think it's going to be much different. And I say that because you have right now 18 players locked up to a contract next year. You have when the arbitration process is all done, 
you're going to have a total of about $175 million locked up into this roster. You don't have much roster flexibility and you can't go out and sign a big name free agent. You're going to have to look for guys on one-year contracts. Um, That's why I think don't be surprised if Tommy Pham comes back on a one-year deal. He's already said that he would come back on a one-year deal um, for the Padres. So I don't see this roster being in this lineup being much different next year, unless like we talked about, you make a big move and get rid of either Myers or Hosmer or the dream scenario is getting rid of them both. So then now you have a, a good chunk of money to play with in the off season to start not rebuilding this lineup, but getting better pieces in here and getting more flexibility with guys. Um, but if that doesn't happen, like if, if Hosmer somehow stays on this team because they can't get rid of him because of his contract. And if somehow Myers stays on this team because they can't find any suitors and they can't get rid of him because of his contract, it's honestly hard to think like how much different the roster could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and yeah. And, and like the bench, like they need power, but you have Profar. You already have Profar there. You already have Kim there. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I mean, the Marisnik deal last year didn't make sense at all. Uh, but right. it's like, I think he's gone, but it's like, okay, what was that for? But yeah, they, they just need power. I mean, Caratini, you're not going to get power out of Nola's not a power hitter. He had mm-hmm. like two home runs this year. So yeah. they just need more power, but it's like, like you said, Preller kind of pigeonholed himself with the, you know, contracts that he has among the starting lineup. So that, that makes it difficult. Um, let's see. Do you think the front office needs to add to the rotation? That's another thing where guys are under contract. There's only so much you can do. You just hope that guys don't get hurt, really. Yeah, and that's a really bad strategy to have is hopes and ifs. You know, you want to have guys that are reliable. Like if this team had five Joe Musgroves in the starting rotation, I'd feel super confident going into next season. But they only have one Joe Musgrove, and they have four or five guys that have injury passed. Um, can't get through a full season. You don't know um, how they're going to perform. And that's the problem is like you said, that they brought in all this pitching last year. That was great. It didn't work out. The the only move in the off season that truly worked out for this franchise was Joe Musgrove. He's Mm -hmm. the only guy that you can say that AJ Preller and Melanson, but yeah, 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 yeah. right. As far as starting rotation goes, um, that was the only move that paid off. He pitched every game, didn't miss a start, never went on the IL. He's, he is a perfect pitcher and exactly what this team needs more of. Um, so now you're going to go in the offseason, or excuse me, next year. You're hoping that Darvish, another year older, is healthy and can perform without sticky stuff. You're hoping that Blake Snell isn't the Blake Snell that, that, you, that we all saw for the first four months of the season, and instead the Blake Snell we saw in his last seven or eight starts for a full year. Um, okay. You're relying on a guy coming off his second Tommy John surgery and Mike Clevenger. You are relying on maybe Ryan Weathers, a, a guy that didn't really have a great season. He had good moments, but uh, he's, he's young. Um, you're relying on who knows what to Nelson Lamette can give you. I just, I think that guy, unfortunately, uh, now I'm not going to say ruined, but, I just don't, I just don't know if he can get back to that 2020 form. Um, Mackenzie Gore, like, where is he? He's down and pitching in like the, the lowest level of the minor leagues possible. Um, Again, if they do not get money off this book, off this roster and get some flexibility, it's going to be extremely hard to go out in free agency and pick up any more pitchers. Um, So yeah, I think they're really going to go into next season and Preller is going to look at this rotation and say, all right, we have Musgrove, we have Snell, we have Darvish, um, Clevenger will come back and we have Weathers and who knows what we can get from Morhone. He's coming off of the Tommy John surgery. Um, who knows what we're going to get from Paddock. His elbow's all messed up right now. Um, it kind of feels like the more you talk about it, the more of a mess they have in the rotation. Yeah. But the only thing you can rely on right now with the rotation is hopes and ifs. Yeah. Um, another kind of hope, at least for me, 
is that Tatis gets the surgery. Preller said, I think yesterday that they're making, you know, the next week or so, then they'll, you know, they'll announce if he's having the surgery or not. Um, but do you think he should get the surgery? And I, at least for me, I thought that he would have already gotten it by now. I mean, it's been a couple weeks since the season ended. I'm on the side of let the player decide. Like if he doesn't want to get surgery, then that's his choice. Um, if he doesn't, like if say he tears his, I don't want to put his bad juju on him, but say, if, say a player tears their ACL, they have to get a surgery, right? You have to get that repaired. If you break a bone that potentially needs surgery, you have to get surgery. Tatis played through this injury. He played through it and he hit 42 home runs in 130 games. Right. Does he have to get the surgery or does, or can he play through it? It, it feels like in his mind, he's telling himself, I played 130 games and hit 42 home runs and I'm going to be a top three candidate for MVP. And I didn't get the surgery. Why do I need it? You know, like, why do I need to get the surgery? Nobody wants to get surgery. Like, I don't want to get surgery. You don't want to get surgery. If you don't have to, like nobody ever wants to get surgery. Um, that's, that's what happened with Denos Lamette. He was given another option to rehab his arm. And the doctors that he spoke to said, you don't need surgery. You can do this. And of course he chose the other path because someone told him he doesn't need surgery. So if one doctor, that's all it takes is one. If one doctor says you can not have, you don't have to have surgery. You can just rehab this thing and you can play with it, then he's going to choose not to have surgery. Like it's up to him. No one can tell him what to do. Um, all I want for him is him to be the healthiest version of Fernando Tatis Jr. possible. Cause he is the most by far fun player to watch in the, in the entire sport. And it makes me happy and it makes you happy. I'm sure. And it makes every Padres fan happy when they see Tatis being Tatis. That's why it, it, it sucked to watch him kind of, you know, rain back a little bit this year when he came back from his injury. Cause I think he had like two stolen bases after mm -hmm. he came back from his third stint on the IL, they put him in the outfield, you know, it just, it wasn't Tatis being Tatis. And that is all I want for him is to be the best version of Tatis because when he is that he is by far, no questions asked the most exciting player in baseball. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not going to like say that I want him to get surgery. I just want him, you know, if that, if that's the best course of action, then, then yeah, but it's just, it's hard to, to try to force a guy to get surgery um, when he doesn't necessarily absolutely need it. All right. Yeah. All right. So Tatis obviously has, obviously he has the extension. Who, who do you see uh, possible extension candidates for the Padres this year? Musgrove's obviously at the top. Um, but who else do you think could be in that? I mean, that's look the extension that is definitely low on the list of priorities mm -hmm. for the Padres, you know, this off season. Um, but it definitely wouldn't hurt to get, you know, at least Musgrove done based on what he did last year. Oh yeah. He's, he is. And I even tweeted this out. Like if AJ Preller returns, he's got to be the number one priority to lock up. Mm -hmm. I know he has, uh, an, an arbitration year coming up. Um, this would be his last season with the team. If they don't get a extension with him. like you have to get extension with Musgrove. There's, there's no, you have to, um, you cannot let him get to free agency, especially what he has done with his town. The, the things that um, he has shown this year, as far as being reliable, um, you can't let him get to free agency. You have to lock up Musgrove. That's number one. Uh, the bullpen Melanson had a really good year. But am I going to give Melanson a three-year deal? No way. No. no way am I giving Melanson a three-year deal. A.J. Preller, to all of his faults, I will give him 100% credit where credit's due. He has done a really good job at finding closers. He, he, like, that's one of his strengths, is bringing in guys that, like you know, Kirby Yates, Brad Hand, um, Mark Melanson. He's brought in good closers. So I don't have any problem if they, get, if they go a different direction other than Mark Melanson, I feel like he can find somebody to bring in as the closer. The bullpen, 
little bit different there. You never want to spend big money on bullpen arms. That's why, you know, the, the Drew Pomerantz with Pomerantz right. and yeah, that deal is turning out to be uh, another bad deal. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jake Cronenworth, you don't have to worry about yet because no. he has, I think three more years of arbitration left. Um, same thing with Trent Grisham. So as far as like locking anybody up, like an absolute must is Joe Musgrove. You don't have to worry about, Cronaworth now you don't really have to worry about Grisham right now um Melanson I'm okay with if you let him go if you brought him back on a two-year deal or even a one-year deal and just give him a higher average uh, annual salary I'm cool with that so it kind of feels like a Trevor Rosenthal situation where they were kind of wanted to but they were like yeah if you're gonna go if it's what was it like 15 million okay it was like a, yeah yeah, yeah it was like it was exactly and it's like we can we, there's other options we can we can find other options um yeah. that, that that's fine it's just it's all about spending smart money and right. that's that's the part of aj preller that i question sometimes is you know you spent this money on hosmer you spent this money on myers you spent this money on profar you spent this money on kim that has all turned out not to be smart money spent and mm -hmm. the smartest money he spent this year was Mark Melanson. Like that turned out, you look at that $3 deal. $3 million. Led the league in saves, had an ERA of like two, three or something. I mean, all-star. That is smart money spent. And he needs to do more of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So last one here, let's describe a successful Padres offseason. Manager, who, who were my, I like Buck Showalter. That's the guy I want, but. Who about, what about you? I like Buck. Um, I'm a Bochi guy. Like I, yeah. I would take Bochi in a heartbeat. I think if they brought in Bruce Bochi, they would fix a lot of problems with that clubhouse. I just don't think, yeah. I mean, that's, that's like a dream, but I, I, I don't think yeah. that's realistic, but no, I, I think that if Peter Seidler got rid of AJ Preller, that's more of a possibility to bring in Bochi because you can have Bochi with a general manager that they work well together. Like they have to have a good relationship. You know, you can't bring Bochi in here and expect it to work for four or five years because eventually that that relationship with him and Preller is not going to work out. It just wouldn't. Um, Did Showalter interview? I, I, don't, I don't know if he interviewed. No, I don't think That's why so. I think that Ron Washington's obviously – the most likely because it seemed like they had a good relationship, you know, right. through that interview process. Yeah. And he, he, I think he was a finalist as well. Yeah. Uh, last time I, I think Ron would have been great. Um, I think he would be great for, for this, uh, for this clubhouse, but I, I just, um, I want to, I want to caution everybody that trends are a real thing. And if you look at the trend of AJ Preller, his trend is hiring guys that are yes men. That's his trend. And it's hard to change who you are as a person. Like it's just, it's just fundamentally hard for someone to just change who they are. I think you can evolve. And I think that people um, can change certain aspects about themselves, but deep down in AJ Preller's core, he is who he is and that's not changing. So I would caution people don't be surprised if he brings in another first time guy. And, and, and that's the thing that concerned me also with this Peter Seidler thing yesterday is Peter was like, yeah, the experience isn't like a must. Right. I'd rather, you know, hire the right 34 year old than the wrong 60 year old. Uh, yeah. and, and it's like, well, I, I understand what you're saying, but not everyone's Kevin cash. Not ever. Right. Preller has not hired the right 34 year old. That's the problem. Right. And, and you're right. You reading that is like, Oh boy, are you bracing everybody else again for a potential first time hire? Like I would not be shocked if he goes out and gets another first time guy, except the difference this time would be the guy he gets actually was a former big leaguer that has a good resume under his belt in the big leagues. Like that would, that to me would be the biggest difference if AJ Preller goes out and hires another first time guy that the, the guy he hires played like 10 years in the bigs, made a couple all-star teams um, respected in every clubhouse that he was in.
But again, this would be his first time job managing. Right. And that is scary as hell to think that that, that could happen. Again. And who would that even like, what, Phil Nevin or Will Venable? Like that's... Well, that Phil Nevin, I mean, I wouldn't consider that to be like as risky because he's been in, you know, coaching with the Yankees right. um, for how many years and he's been here and, and all of that. I'm talking like a, like a guy that's not even managing in the big leagues on any roster or any coaching staff right now. Like I'm talking like a former player. Um, like a Nick, Nick Hunley. Exactly. Like that type of guy, or, or even you can go the route and he was actually hired by the Mets, but then he was fired because of the whole cheating scandal, like Carlos Beltran, you know, a, a guy with a great playing career, never's managed before. Like I'm like that type of guy. I would not be shocked if that's the guy that AJ Pryor goes gets instead of who the entire fan base wants is Ron Washington or Buck Walter or Bruce Bochy. Right. Yeah, I, I just don't want fans to have to, and I'm not talking about me or you, people that would probably know, but I don't want to have to Google the guy's name. <laughs> right. Like, that's, who is this guy? Like, Andy Green and Jace Tingler was like, okay, who are these guys? That's That was the red flag. It's like, you did it to Andy Green. I was like, okay. And then you do it to Jace, and then it's Jace Tingler. And I remember, because I was in high school at the time, and I'm looking up his name, and uh, and I, I fr- my friends could not deal with me that day that that news came down because right. it was like you had you had Ron Washington in your hands, he was mm-hmm. right there. You want to go that whole former Texas Ranger route? He was still there, and it, it was like, okay, this better work, and it worked for a two month season. And then it fell apart when you had to implement the National League rules and the full season. Uh, so, yeah, that's, yeah. Also, right, so, also yeah, real ahead. quick, before we move on, yeah. this franchise, the last time they hired a manager, and the last time this franchise has hired a manager with previous managing experience, you know who that was? Was it Bochi? No, no, Bochi was for... Um... It was Jack McKeon. Okay, that was the wow. last yeah. time that this franchise has yeah, hired a manager right. with previous managing experience. Bochi, first time guy. Uh, Buddy Black, first time guy. Mm-hmm. Andy Green, first time guy. And then Jace Tingler, first time guy. Pat Murphy for half that half season, first time guy. And you what know, does it Dick- say? What does it say that, you know, the statement I thought was funny because Preller saying, yeah, we're going to relieve him of his duties and then we're going to just praise him the rest of the statement. <laughs> um, you know, saying, Second and win percentage, only 10 games over 500. Like, yeah, that's how, why, that's how bad that is. If this guy's so great, then why'd you fire him? Yeah. If, if you're going to say that he's like one of the best managers in franchise history as far as winning percentage goes, why'd you fire him? Like, yeah. why'd you get rid and, of him? Yeah. And, you know, Seidler was saying it was a tough decision and we could have, you know, kept him as late as Tuesday night. And they were trying to say that, a lot of the stuff that happened this year wasn't because of Tingler. Okay, then why'd you get rid of him? Right. You know, like, why, why'd you get rid of that guy? And then back to what Sider said about Preller, if you told me, if I didn't know the record of this franchise with Preller as GM, I would have thought this dude won four World Series with this team. Like, that's the type of messaging that I got and felt from this organization as far as their backing for, for AJ Preller. Like, this guy must have won, question. like, 10 World Series. Yeah, there was one question that Q and A with Sidler yesterday about how you know how how confident are you now that he you know there hasn't been a winning season. It was something that affect, and he's like, I'm even more confident in him now. <laughs> it's like because he's not going to make the same mistake or something. It's like, well, yeah, he made the same mistake. That's the problem. Right. So it was just so much mixed messaging. Um, but just to finish my last question. The successful offseason, what would that be for you roster-wise? Roster-wise? Like, you want me to go dream scenario here? Realistic dream scenario. So <laughs> Realistic? If that's, like, the Stroman not going to happen. They don't have the money. That's that's no. not – that Stroman earned a big contract this year. Just, like, realistic additions, subtractions, 
what would that be? Well, the first thing this team needs is they need a power bat. They need a power outfield bat. You don't have it. You have two guys on this team with um, massive pop. That's Manny and Tatis. Cronenworth can give you 20, 25 homers, but is he a threat every single time he goes to the plate to give you a, you know, 400 foot blast? Like he's not, he's a really good player and he's a staple of this franchise right now, but you have two guys that you can legitimately say at any moment they can hit a, a home run. Mm-hmm. So they need a power bat. And I just looking at the free agent list and I, I was looking the other day, I don't know how realistic it would be. Um, but I look at a guy like Jock Peterson, you know, a, a left-handed power bat. He's not going to hit for average, but that's not the game anymore. You need a guy that can give you a, you know, 25 to 30 home runs. If he hits there hasn't 220, been a whole ton of average hitting anyway on this team. No. And that, like, it, you, like I could, I could deal with Eric Hosmer if he gave you 30 home runs, mm. but he doesn't even get close to that. So the, one of the priorities that I think they can do right away is getting some pop and who knows if the DH comes into play next year. If that happens, then ov- the obvious candidate is Nelson Cruz. They try to get him at the deadline. He's another guy that I think would, would, be a really good clubhouse guy with Manny and Tatis and, 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 and all those players. Um, love to have so, Fran Mill right now. Oh, yeah. Everyone would <laughs> love to have Fran Mill right now. Um, and you know, Renfro. Ty, well, and, and Ty France. And, uh, you know, you, you can name up the, uh, down the line. Yeah. You can name like a whole entire starting nine that Preller's traded away. They're like, man, I wish this guy was here. Um, but yeah, this team needs pop. So, like a one-year deal for, for Jock Peterson. Like I would, I would take that in a heartbeat. I don't think um, this guy would be obtainable because he had such a great season, but he signed a one-year deal with the Nationals this year, and that's Kyle Schwarber. You know, he, Kyle Schwarber signed a one-year $10 million deal with the Nationals this year, and he was amazing. I don't think he would sign another one-year deal. I think he would want to sign a multi-year deal. But like that's the type of player's – I would love AJ Preller to go get is these one year guys with a proven track record, massive pop and let them prove themselves instead of going out and giving guys like pro far, like a three-year deal or Hassan Kim, a four-year deal for $27 million. You're like, what, what are we doing here? Like get some guys like, like Mark Melanson. He gave him a one-year deal, went out and proved himself, had a great season. That's perfect. Do the same thing with the lineup. Do the same thing with the outfield. That's the first thing. The second thing, is you got to shore up this bullpen. You got to get this bullpen um, better. Emilio Pagan, what are you going to do with him? Drew Pomeranz, how is he going to be? Um, you're going to be need looking for a closer. Uh, I don't really know anybody that I look at in the farm system as like an up and comer guy, um, like a like a Duvall with the with the Giants right mm-hmm. now. Like I don't, I just. I don't know the farm system that well. I don't know if they have that in the system, but you need to shore that up. And then obviously the pitching staff, like, I I don't know what they can do though. That's the thing, but those are the needs of this team. Um, And those are the the realistic things I think they can do in this off season. And, And again, the pipe dream, you get rid of Hosmer, you get rid of Myers, you create a bunch more, roster flexibility with your payroll, and then you can go out and you can improve in areas that really need improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. This has been episode 67. Jim, thanks so much. That was really fun. Yeah, Uh, man. Thank you. Again here, Jim Russell, you can catch him on extra 1360. Uh, Again, this has been episode 67 of the Talking Fires podcast. Until next time, let's go Padres.